The moment this photograph was taken on the eve of Christmas 1968, humanity took a different view of our home, planet Earth. Today, we appreciate the complexity of the system. We know about the limits of our resources. We know about the vulnerability of ecosystems. And we have learned a lot about the risks of climate change. However, there are still politicians in this country and even presidential candidates who outright say climate is not changing, climate has always changed, and humans are just humans. So what I would like to do tonight is to remove three myths that are created by lobbyists, by people with hidden agenda, when it comes to inform the public about climate change and its causes. The first myth is greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere are so minute and tiny, how could they ever have an effect on our climate? We don't even see these greenhouse gases. So let's look at the numbers as we do in physics, indeed. If you count a million molecules out of the air, you will find about 780,000 nitrogen molecules. You will find about 210,000 oxygen molecules. Thank God. <laughs> and then you will find about 3,900 water molecules. Very relieved that I do find them. And then only about 280 CO2 molecules, carbon dioxide, this greenhouse gas everybody's talking about, 280 molecules in a million molecules in the air. There is another gas that the politicians often mention with agriculture much more potent greenhouse gas. But I only find, if I'm lucky, one molecule of methane in the million molecules of air. So what is it with these molecules? Well, the three last ones, water, carbon dioxide, and methane, they have a very special characteristics. They are greenhouse gases. And they are greenhouse gases in the sense that they can absorb energy, they start to vibrate, and radiate away that energy again. That's responsible for the natural greenhouse effect. And what does that do for us? It's a physical service to every living being on this planet. Why? Because these 4,200 molecules in a million molecules. They are responsible for a temperature increase of about 33 degrees Celsius. Figure that. The mean temperature on the planet at the surface is about 15 degrees Celsius. 33 degrees Celsius would bring us down to minus 18. Water is frozen. Nobody could live. So greenhouse gases enable life. Without greenhouse gases, we wouldn't be here. So greenhouse gases are good. However, the number of these, change, of these greenhouse gases has changed. And we know roughly about by how much. There are 210 water molecules that have been added to the atmosphere in the past 250 years. In the same time, the number of carbon dioxide molecules has increased by about 40%. And the number of methane molecules has doubled. The reason for that change? Still relatively small numbers compared to the million, 
inducing politicians to say climate change doesn't exist, is that we are burning fossil fuels, and we're cutting down the rainforest, and we're generally using energy in an unsustainable way. Now, compare these numbers in the white box relative to these tiny numbers that are printed yellow. They are a sizable fraction of these small numbers. And if 4,200 molecules, greenhouse gas molecules, are able to increase the planet temperature by 33 degrees Celsius, then we must take serious note of the fact that we have added 330 molecules in the last 250 years to the atmosphere. It's a sizable fraction, and therefore, the question that there will be warming isn't really there anymore. That's the first myth that is clearly scientifically debunked. Carbon dioxide can be reconstructed. We know how much carbon dioxide was here in the atmosphere in pre-industrial times. We even know 800,000 years ago how many carbon dioxide molecules somebody would have counted and found in a million molecules at the time. We do this at the University of Bern by analyzing these bubbles in ice that we collect in Antarctica, construct time series curves of carbon dioxide concentration over the past 800,000 years and are able to put into context today's concentrations that you see at the far right of this graph, which now exceed 400 in number. Never before in the past 800,000 years have we had such concentrations of that level. Second myth. Global warming has passed. I'm sure you have heard that somewhere in the media. Well, let's look at the numbers. Here you see time series of temperature since 1880, based on millions of measurements that scientists and institutions have taken all over the world, for the northern hemisphere in red and the southern hemisphere in blue. Of course, climate is changing, but 2014 was a record warm year in this um, record since 1880. 2015, another one. I can assure you 2016, I already feel it now, and we can measure it, will be another record year. So where on this graph is this climate pause? People have said, well, the climate pause is between 1998 and 2012. Well, go figure. It's not a very special 15-year period, and therefore that myth that was used so abundantly in the media is debunked. Even in Switzerland, we see that our environment is warming. See here the stamp collection of the Swiss map since 1961. The white and blue colors in the first half, the red colors in the second half. You recognize the very warm years of, nine, of uh, 2014, 2015, but also the hot summer, 2003, which led to mean annual temperature in Switzerland that were relatively high. That is why in the last assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we were quite confident, based on these data, we said warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And all countries actually agreed to this simple statement. The third myth is an interesting one, because everybody can perform an experiment that teaches us that the statement, climate change cannot be predicted, is a myth. So let's look at a slightly different formulation of this myth. A slightly more general statement is, Simple systems can be predicted. Complex systems cannot be predicted. They are simply too complicated. I brought you a little example of a simple system. 
where we want to check whether this simple system can really be predicted. We have a pendulum here. It's a bit of a strange shape, but you can see that if I tip here on one side of the pendulum, that pendulum performs precisely the movement that you all know from some of your first physics lessons. It goes back and forth with a period of frequency. It's very simple. This is a simple system, but it's only a seemingly simple system because look, the simple system can also behave non-linearly. We have heard this before. It's a very complicated system which is unpredictable. So the statement, simple systems can be predicted, is not correct. Let's see whether we can... Uh... <laughs> there are full of surprises in this experiment. Let's go to the slides. The statement, complex systems cannot be predicted, seems more intuitively correct. How many times have we said, oh, it's just too complicated, and we've turned our faces away? Let's look at the complex system that I bet every single person in this room is confronted with every morning. And you actually are all physicists performing that experiment, have been performing that day in, day out, for as long as you have become independent. Here is the system. A pot. You put the pot on a boiler plate. You fill the pot with a liter of water. You put your boiler plate to level three, because you know that after you feed your cat and you come back, then the water is warm. I have two systems here, and I ask two different questions to this complex system. Because look at the system. The water is boiling. This is truly a complex system if you ask, what is the flow of the water in this boiling water? Tell me the velocity, the speed of the water molecule at about half depth in the center of the pot. You cannot answer this question. It's truly a complex system. But if you ask the question, what is the average temperature of the water? Then you all know you perfectly are able to respond to that question. In fact, you've performed that experiment a thousand or thousands of times. So it very much depends on the question whether you can predict a complex system or you cannot predict the complex system. On the left, we have no chance. This is turbulence, all the nice nonlinear processes the scientists cut and grind their teeth on. The right question is an easy question on a complex system. And so, why can we respond to this question? Because we use physics, energy conservation, that says, if you know the power that goes into the system, then through some thinking and calculation, I will be able to predict the temperature after five minutes. That is the time I need to feed the cat. And the same thing happens in the climate system. If you ask the climate system, the Earth system, different questions, some of these questions you cannot answer, other questions you can. Let's look at that. Well. Weather is a good example. It's part of the climate system. In fact, people say, oh, weather and climate, I don't really know what the difference is. And I usually have to explain that during uh, aperitifs and parties and receptions. <laughs> I don't do that now. But what we do in, when we consider the weather, we want to forecast it. And you all know that after about five or ten days, these forecasts become very difficult unprecise, sometimes impossible. You plan a party, and Mr. Bucheli got it wrong. That's not his fault. It's a complex system, and you want to predict it 
too far out in time. So you're asking the wrong question. Well, when we do the forecast, we have to have all the information of today's weather. If we do climate projection into the future, we ask the question, what is the temperature on Earth in the year 2100? And that's a simple question because we can use energy conservation and other laws of physics that tell us, given the knowledge how much carbon dioxide molecules will be in the atmosphere in the year 2100, that we can calculate that temperature. That is why this myth is debunked. So based on these three myths that science has removed, CO2 has no effect. Yes, it does, a very strong one. Earth is not warming. Yes, it does, very strongly in the past 50 years. And climate is unpredictable, simply wrong. Based on that, our report that was the scientific basis for the Paris Agreement of last December has made a few very simple statements. The first is, warming of the climate system is unequivocal. Human influence on the climate system is clear. Continued greenhouse gas emissions will cause further warming and limiting climate change will require substantial and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. This is the language of scientists. Isn't that easy? Well, they thought it was easy as well. They celebrated in December a historical agreement. I think it's fantastic, but where do we go from here? What we need is an industrial revolution in order to limit climate change to well below 2 degrees Celsius, what the Paris Agreement simply says. What is that, a fourth industrial revolution? Well, we all lived to the mechanization, the first industrial revolution. The second industrial revolution was electrification. The third industrial revolution, many of us, if I look at the gray hairs, have actually lived through that as well, digitalization. We're still in that industrial revolution. But the fourth industrial revolution looks like this. New products that liberate us from the fossil fuel dependency. And we call that decarbonization. And it is truly an industrial revolution. It is global. It is difficult. It requires all our strength and willpower. An industrial revolution is not only a pain how these same politicians want us to believe. Decarbonization is not possible. It's destroying all kinds of things that we are used to. No. Look at the past three industrial revolutions. What did they do? They created smarter products. They created new jobs and new professions. Some old jobs, of course, disappeared. They produced overall a better life quality. And with the mistakes that we have experienced in the past three industrial revolutions, I'm personally convinced that we will make fewer mistakes in that fourth industrial revolution. And overall, every of the three past industrial revolutions has created new values. Thank you very much for your attention.